How is it possible that someone can be grateful for hardship? Navigating this profound physical experience is very difficult. But I'm not the only person that has experienced hardship. I wanted to speak to people that are on the other side of hardship and found the gold in their suffering. In the process of interviewing these powerful people, I realized something about myself. Their journey is my journey, and that I have much to learn about the acceptance of where I'm at in my life at this point. A few years ago, if you would have asked me about gratitude, I would have a different answer than I do today. How is it possible that someone can have gratitude through incredible hardship? It's where my dad kicked me out. I had breast cancer and I had a store that I lost. My marriage ended. My dog died. <laughs> and I got fired from my job. Cancer, known as, known as papillary carcinoma. My younger brother was really sick for about 10 years. Leukemia ended with a double lung transplant that was unsuccessful. Being struck by a car as a pedestrian. Just had my heart broken. And we went through about a decade or more of a very hard time with the civil war and sanctions and everything else. How could someone possibly be grateful when the hardship is so extreme? And is there a hierarchy to suffering? Involved in drugs. My genocide experience. Parkinson. A decade-long autoimmune condition, grueling divorce. <laughs> My partner would commit suicide. A brain injury. Um, organ prolapse. I was beaten like, and I could not walk. I had terminal cancer. I started this project with four questions. First question, how do you define gratitude? Gratitude comes in levels. I think there's like different ways that you can, you can be grateful. Involves love very much. I think the other kind of gratitude is to toward people and, and friends. Like a pure gratitude was being grateful without a should. Gratitude is connected with a, a belief, faith in the powers that are higher than myself. And while we can call it divine, we can call it the guru. It's recognizing the things that are going well in, in your life. So I think everyone has something to be grateful for. So like something that has been good for me, whether I've liked it or not, recognizing the benevolence and what's been going on. So I have the feeling of being grateful for something, which is kind of a soft, peaceful thing. And then I have the action of being grateful. In the English language, how transactional uh, gratitude can be like we're gra we're grateful for something or grateful to have something. It's not just thank thank you or something. It's a way of living with yourself and with others. The ability to recognize that whatever is happening right now at this present moment is a gift, and it's a gift for you. That you take uh, seriously or something that touches your heart and you're really grateful of having that experience. It's almost visceral. Like if you're, grat if you're grateful about something, it, it's something that you can almost like feel the energy of it. It's an amplification or larger expression of the joy for this life. It's a way to live. Um, if you're thankful for everything that you have or are or that's going on around you, your life becomes so much richer. You'll run into the most amazing people. You'll run across the most remarkable circum situations. You'll be able to help people in ways you never could have imagined. And it's stepping back and asking what really matters. Gratitude's the energy that connects you to other people who also have gratitude and love. Gratitude just makes everything better, makes everything easier, makes everything bearable. When I'm grateful, I'm humble. <laughs> when I'm grateful, I'm respectful. When I'm grateful, I'm loving and kind. 
and gratitude seems to bring more gratitude the more you can surrender to it. And my second question, what are you grateful for? So I'm incredibly grateful for my family. The health and welfare of my children. To, to know that gratitude doesn't cancel out um, difficulty also. You know that, um, that one can be incredibly grateful for one's partner or one's family and also harbor, you know, uh, all sorts of mucky emotions. You know, so, so to be able to hold the complexity of gratitude, um, I think is important. Uh, yeah, I'm grateful to my new country, Canada. I mean, we, for immigrants, it's more obvious maybe than for people who are born in Canada. Without the complexity of other emotions that may feel like they're in conflict with gratitude, I believe that we need to, f to be able to feel our anger and our melancholy and our depression or anxieties in order to feel gratitude. Because if, if, if we're just uh, tightly holding the gratitude, we're, we're, just, we're, we're not allowing ourselves the full spectrum of emotion and human ex experience. I'm, I'm grateful for my resilience. I'm, I'm grateful for my optimism. <laughs> I'm grateful I'm learning more and more how to reach out for help. So, may, okay, so this is corny, but I'm, uh, I am... I am grateful for gratitude in and of itself. When I'm walking beside the river, I'll suddenly be grateful for just the beauty. And it's overwhelming. And it makes my heart feel full and that makes me feel kind of expanded. Because first of all, I'm alive. The thing that I'm most grateful for is today. It's for right now. Every time you breathe, that's a gift. I'm grateful for the things that I didn't earn. So it's the things that I, f I think were given to me or that I lucked into. I'm particularly grateful for them. So, for example, um, I'm a Canadian and I was born in Canada. I am a certain height that is considered average so I don't have any of the challenges of being a lot shorter or a lot taller than that. I was born to parents that are, although, you know, they have their challenges like everyone, are very loving, uh, were very supportive of education. I didn't do those things. When, when I was working on my Parkinson recovery and I was trying to work out issues of life and joy and gratitude, I realized whatever was in my life, first I had to have this life. And I'm so appreciative for a lot of things that might seem mundane uh, and very benign, but the more I really, really see them, the more I feel it's the domino effect of gratitude. The more I see it, the more I experience it, and the more I feel like I have to be grateful for. Everything that arrived in my life was an opportunity for me to give gratitude because if it was in my life, then it was an extension of the original gratitude for having this life. So once I realized in my recovery that everything I was doing was a gift, I started giving gratitude for everything. The chance to slow down, my life was going so fast. I never had time. And that's how I got in this problem, into this mess, is I, I, I was never able to carve out time for myself. And um, in these last few months, I've had almost nothing but <laughs> time for myself. So um, uh, that's definitely something to be grateful for. I am grateful that I am closer to the person I would hope I would become a long time ago. Like I may not feel, yay, I get to go through another crappy moment, 
But I do recognize and I'm grateful for the fact that I at least know that this is leading to something. I'm thankful for people who made me who I am, who give me joy, who help me think I need to balance good things and bad things because both of them made me who I am, made me stronger, shakes me, give me fear, give me joy. Yeah, I'm grateful for opportunities. I'm grateful for growth. When I see myself connected, that's where my gratitude really abounds. Oh my God, what don't I have to be grateful for is the better question. Just like, it's really what I don't, I don't, I can't imagine what I'm not thankful for. I just can't. I pose these questions to complete strangers and friends from around the world with hopes to find some wisdom for myself in this journey. This is difficult. I'm used to having physical capacity beyond my, beyond my stature. And this, this is incredibly difficult. But there's gifts. What are these gifts? What do people have to offer? And truly, is there a scale of hardship? What is perspective? Wait, really, have you ever had a hardship that was a blessing in disguise at the end of it? I was to say, most of the things that I have experienced in my life that would, could be categorized as negative, I have gratitude for, as, as well as other emotions, of course. Um, the, it's the big losses uh, in my life, whether that be at people or relationships, um, or jobs or you know whatever forms those losses have come in that have taught me the most um, from a depth psychology perspective there is a uh, archetypal experience in life called initiation um, and initiations happen all the time big and small and essentially what initiation is is you know, cross, crossing a threshold um, of, of suffering so um, I like to explain initiation as kind of tootling along in our everyday life. Um, and then a, a loss usually or a trauma um, kicks us off of a cliff, if you will, and we descend into darkness. Um, and, and then, you know, the depths of despair can be really engulfing. And yet on the other side of that, on the ascension, when we start to ascend and we we reach on the other side, we, we're, we're wiser, we're different. Um, and, and there's something that we can bring from our experiences, some gold that we can bring back and give um, in service to others and to, to ourselves. Um, and so for those gold nuggets, I am grateful. Uh, being diagnosed with thyroid cancer was uh, a tough arc to go through. And I think the most challenging moment was getting a phone call from my physician, my GP. You know, normally her assistant would call me, you know, if there was an appointment, whatever, but she called me personally. And then as soon as I heard it, I thought, oh, God damn it. <laughs> you know, I've got cancer for sure. There's no reason why she would call me. A lot of the panic and a lot of the sadness that came along with, you know, is this going to kill me? And I think anyone who's had any kind of a diagnosis of any significance can relate to this. So I'm going, but I haven't done this in my life yet, or I haven't done this in my life yet. There's been so much that felt like life took from me, that felt punishing, that felt like I wasn't getting what I wanted. I'm either at a place yet, or maybe ever will, where I kind of go, yay, I got cancer. So one of the things I am grateful for is I have, especially when it comes to health healthcare, I've got this real... Um, determination. I would ask myself, why are they dying? And I'm, I, I'm still okay. And then when I, when I made it, and no one else really does, I had this big guilt thing. Um, but I also had this ridiculous self imposed imposed pressure to damn, you better do something pretty amazing with your life now. 
I, I feel like some big fear has been dropped. I'm not sure what the fear is really. I, like if I found I had more cancer tomorrow, I wouldn't be thrilled about it. There's no doubt. But I wouldn't have the baggage of the shock. And I think that's something a lot of people can relate to as well. Like once you get a diagnosis about something, whatever way you're dealing with it, if you get another one, okay, it's not great, but it's not this huge hit that you get from the first one. There's certainly a lot of gratitude around the fact that it was only papillary carcinoma. All your life just comes crumbling it down. I didn't have a, a job. So the whole sense of security, the whole sense of what will happen with my house, the whole sense of what will happen with my daughter, and that you are somehow majorly flawed. I doubted everything, doubted everything. I should be strong enough to be able to pull myself up. Well, you can't. Even though I didn't think maybe I was worth it, I knew Kristen was worth it. I'm incredibly grateful for that whole process because I, there was miracles in there. There were miracles. I every every day at my peak of decimation, I would hit my couch at like one one oh five. It was just bone weary, tired. I didn't have a choice. I couldn't have went outside. I couldn't have walked the block. I couldn't have walked ten feet. Uh, without that devastation, um, I didn't get to where I am now. I am darn proud of where I am now, and I am darn happy with who I am. Because this is the path that we have, and that has to happen for a reason. I think when my father passed away, the, the thing, my takeaway from that, of course you're going to be sad because you love him, of course. But you have to remember that that final chapter was written before he was born, and there were things that he needed to do, and he did them, and he did them successfully. It's when you think the world is uh, is going to be one way, and and um, and it's not. You know, suffering is attachment. That was, for me, that was one of those big moments in realizing how, you know, and that's the struggle. Like, attachment, that's why you're attached, because you can't let go of it. Life is suffering, and it's beautiful. <laughs> Without suffering, I don't think there is beauty. And, yeah, for me, that was identity and all about who I was and who I was going to be and and uh, letting go of that's really um, is terrifying because, you know, what, what are you going to hold on to? So I went through a decade long autoimmune condition that was a loss of my health at quite a young age. And the gift of that, the beauty of that was that it took me on the trajectory of studying Ayurvedic medicine. And I'm now a clinical Ayurvedic specialist and help other people overcome uh, and navigate their own health uh, issues and challenges and disease and difficult thing for me to digest, especially at a young age when my friends were off, like doing the things that I wanted to be doing. And I couldn't even walk up a flight of stairs without feeling exhausted. Uh, the specialists essentially said, there's nothing that we can do for you. Sorry, we've done tests and we'll just call what you have post viral fatigue syndrome. It's an autoimmune condition. Absolutely devastating. Cause I was at the end of the road medically. And they were like, yeah, well, this is it. And I thought, I can't live like this. I can't live not being able to walk up a flight of stairs. I used to dance like six, even eight hours a day, having all of this energy, all of this vitality, and then having it taken, right? And it can, it affects us mentally. It affects us emotionally. It affects our psyche. It affects our whole identity. I had no resources financially or otherwise to be able to explore and investigate things. And that's really what took me to study Ayurvedic medicine. So I thought, if no one's going to figure it out for me, then I'm going to have to empower myself and figure it out, uh, which I did. And it wasn't a quick fix, but it was a slow uh, process and, and probably slow for a reason, because there were so many things that I needed to integrate on the deeper realms and energetically and psychically to really become more of who I am. Like the dad's just made your life like, like, you know, just like no social life. Like he literally told me that there's nothing wrong with being a loner. And that's something that you should aspire to being. <laughs> oh my God. I was already doing plays, but like six, seven, like I was in a commercial when I was like super young and I was loving it. But then 
they figured out I was good at math. So then my dad kind of threw me into that whole like mathlete world. Um, ended up like representing the country. Cause then um, I, I think the beauty of it is I had to figure out how to entertain myself. Musical theater kicked in. So like, as I'd be doing math because I hated my life um, and didn't want to do this math, I just started like playing albums in the background. So I'd just sing along as I was doing my, as I was selfing my math. So it's kind of funny how such a messed up situation ended up kind of opening, like forced me to kind of like, what do I want? I don't want to be doing math for the rest of my life. And I think the beauty of being able to go to Canada, because when when uh, we, I found out when I was 14, I think, that we were moving and I was like petrified. But then the moment I got here, it was like I I just sprang out of that like isolated living. I went through a grueling divorce. <laughs> But at the time, I remember saying, like, this is the worst thing that I'll ever have to go to go through it. And then fast forward some years and I was in a relationship with a, a man that I loved, very gregarious and a very uh, much like the life of the party and bright and shiny and beautiful and intelligent. And one day I came home and he was gone. And... It, we didn't know right away, but ultimately what happened is he had committed suicide. And that experience broke me open in the deepest way I could have ever imagined. It was very surreal for a very long time. Left me not wanting to be on this planet. Like literally, I'm like, if the man that I love and was planning to have a future with and children with and a life with is gone, I don't want to be here. But there was something inside, even throughout the craziness of it and the chaos and the horrendous human experience, there was something eternal. There was that, that light makes me want to cry just sensing into that, like that peace that knew it's going to be okay. There will be something good that comes out of this. What isn't about change? What? tell me what isn't about change like change is beautiful change is amazing it might be hard you may not like it you may wish it didn't happen but it's not going to change it there's always good i think we can make meaning out of things and i think we we have to as humans to um integrate and digest certain life experiences shitty things are going to happen they will and we have a choice point in that moment to say, I'm going to use this to thrive spiritually. I'm going to heal, and I don't mean cure, but healing is very different from curing. Or I'm going to become a victim to this and let this experience that I'm having become my identity, become my story. And those are two different paths. Um, but it's a it's a process to it was for me and how to come out of feeling like I was being punished by the universe, by God, by divine, whatever word you want to use uh, to realizing that life is happening and I get to choose what I make it mean about myself and my reality and what I want to do with that life experience. When I was hitting my bike, so. Um, which also caused <clears throat> some brain trauma, but I wasn't diagnosed properly until the one I was hit by a car uh, walking across the street. They eventually I was diagnosed as having um, a brain injury in my left frontal lobe. Essentially stripped away a lot of my identity and also my past memories were didn't seem like they were mine. My childhood didn't seem like mine. I was just kind of like this new frightened creature. I was my only healer at that time, but I wasn't trying to heal myself. It was just a process that came. But that impact at that moment was the beginning of um, essentially a new life. Wherever I thought I was going, they were just literally knocked out of me that day. So I had to let, let go of that stuff, even though I kind of fought to keep it because I didn't know any better. Uh, the process of coming here, it wasn't easy. I'm from Uganda, but I registered as a refugee in uh, Kenya. 
because of my sexuality, actually, uh, I was beaten, like, and I could not walk. Yeah, it, twice, actually, it was. It was very, very bad. I had, I thought that's the end of me. All of a sudden, I could see my life going and I can't stop it. People were being chased out from where they were living. Massive, like, people were being beaten. So we faced insecurities and uh, we went to United Nations. Desert, you know, there is no, the accommodation is just tents. We were like, oh, we're not safe here. So they took me to a safe house. Um, I'm like, what come, what comes? So I had to surrender, like, you can't fight it. Because the more you fight it, the more it worsens. So the life turned out actually nice because I didn't resist. I just settled into the situation. Then I moved with the situation itself. That my younger brother was really sick for about 10 years. We went through a number of things, started with leukemia, ended with a double lung transplant that was unsuccessful. So it brought our family really close together. It allowed him to find an amazing woman who he then got to marry and have that experience. So he went back to school and got a degree, which luckily VIU let me be his tutor. <laughs> he suffered greatly. I think he also had some years of getting to be the full, beautiful, amazing little spirit that he really was that I don't think he would have ever done had he gotten to just live life the way it was going. I have zero regrets about the decisions I made, but it definitely, it changes a person's life, changes the trajectory of their life. It changed where I lived, uh, what I did for work. It changed, uh, you know, being on call 24 seven for when anything went wrong, even just his fear or panic in the middle of the night. It's really, uh, it's a lot, but I didn't see an alternative for, for me. Parkinson's, as I sometimes will refer to as the best gift in the worst wrapping paper. And you have to get past the wrapping paper, the symptoms, the shaking, the stiffness, the, the slowness. Parkinson's forced me to slow down and reassess my life. And without the Parkinson's, I don't know that I would have ever had the impetus to do that. In the beginning, I knew it was a soul, mind, and body healing. And I thought by having faith in God that I would recover, that was the soul part, by getting anger and frustration and negative emotions out of my life on a regular basis, that would be the mind part. And that when I finished healing my physical body, then I would be finished. All of the things that would tell me that my organs were fine on the inside, I got all of those indications. No change in my symptoms. Um, they had just leveled out, stayed flat. And so I thought, well, I, I must have missed something. The mind part was I had this incredible self-judging, self-criticizing mind that felt that any little mistake, it had to complain to me about it. And I didn't have good feelings about myself. I basically crippled myself for the simple reason that I could not accept that I was a special being simply because I exist. So I'm trying to forgive myself, and I don't even know what I'm trying to forgive myself for. However, my mind is saying, but don't you remember in second grade, right before you turned in your math test, you erased one of your answers and changed it. And it's the only question you missed on the test. So you got a 98 instead of 100. How do you think you can be forgiven for that? I mean, I'm talking about outrageous stuff like that. 
uh, just in a kind of an unofficial refugee uh, in Hungary during the, the war. There was a five of us from Serbia and we were living in sort of an ashram atmosphere. And so we were all disciples. We were all trying our best, but it was very hard. And so around that time, I heard Swamiji at Mount Satsang mentioning, you should pray for your enemy. And it wasn't easy because I didn't feel any kindness and love in my heart for them. At that time, it was rough. And I, I came out from that experience as a transformed or changed person. And as your soul gets brighter and more radiant by you nurturing that seed of God inside you and helping it grow, it will push away the toxicity of the mind and the body known as Parkinson's. I nurtured that seed of God inside me, thanking God truly from my heart for everything. I was still struggling with the whole issue of feeling that there was something inherently wrong with me. And part of why I felt that way is when I was young, I got yelled at. I was a sensitive kid. And so apparently I cried a lot. And I got yelled at not to cry like a girl. That was the biggest issue there at that point. What I did was, it was another conversation I had with myself. Whose opinion do you trust more than anybody? And my answer was easy. I said, that's easy, Sally, who's my wife. Do you think Sally respects herself? I said, absolutely, yes. If there was anything inherently wrong with you as a human being, do you think that Sally would have spent more than five minutes with you, let alone the last couple of decades and had three children with you? I said, no, absolutely not. She wouldn't have spent any more time with me. I pretty much didn't care about anything after that. If I shook more, who cares? If I was slow, who cares? It was the first time that I could remember in my life since early childhood that I really felt there was nothing wrong with me inherently as a human being. The way this whole experience of this kind of like extreme reduction of myself, I think what I've had to learn is to actually listen to my body. And I, for so many years, had repressed pain and physical discomfort and ignored it, that it manifested in this very extreme fashion. Remembering the realization that this is a sacred vessel and we only get one this time around. And even if it doesn't work so well, I'm still so lucky to have one. <laughs> Will eventually be a gift. <laughs> In my mind, you know, that wasn't the best thing for me. The best thing for me was, you know, partying it up and, and doing more cocaine, right? If she didn't come into my life at that time, you know, and trust me, I love my child lots, but at that time I was really down in the gutter. That was the negative in my mind that I didn't want to transfer over there. And uh, it, it happened and it turned out to be the best thing for me. And you and you you're trying to you know heal that person and 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 have them stop what they're doing and move on. You know the biggest thing that person needs is love. Look, I had terminal cancer um, 14 years ago, and you know weighed 115 pounds and was in an isolation room at a hospital for weeks, being fed by a tube and kind of was in palliative care, believe it or not. And I'm still here science and medical people want answers and sometimes there aren't but i'm grateful that that happened to me because it pivoted me to many things that i would never ever have been able to do but for a complete mind shift 
Well, I'll I'll show you this only. I don't know if you can see it, but this is my ever present reminder of um, where I, came, you know, where I was, and um, and how, and it sits, uh, it watches over me every day, um, to kind of keep me on track, but to also remind me, like when you think shit's happening, like seriously, dude, <laughs> like. Shit's not happening. You're just having a, a frustrating day. No, that's shit happening. You know what I mean? That allowed me to find a passion and find a purpose that I never would have found otherwise and allowed me to help others in a way that my normal job never fulfills me in. Many things were negative and many things became positive because I decided to turn them to positive. For example, the genocide, that was really a big negative event of my life. Take away my parents, my house, my childhood, my everything, it was negative. It took a lot long time to turn this in a positive things. It's not positive. Every bad or worse experience in my life, after this experience, I can after say, okay, what have I learned through these bad things? And this makes me me. I would love to say that, you know, I had one of those so quintessential Oprah moments where, you know, the sky opened up and I was told, you know, this is what you're going to do now. You know, <laughs> you know I didn't have any of that. Um, but at the end of the day, over time, I think that's kind of what happened. So, you know, sometimes these things that we think are awful can actually be doors to, to awesome. And sometimes we need this bad experience to realize something. We had a deal um, that I would, if I asked for my shoes, that meant, and this is before you could do um, uh, assisted death, because truthfully, I wouldn't be on the planet had we been able to do assisted death. I would have taken that route a long time ago when I was that sick. But I owe an immense debt of gratitude to my at the time, my crazy then husband for not giving me my shoes. Yeah, so how weird is that? You know, that is the what I'm, why I am still here. And it, it, it's odd to, to think that it's probably really to help others. I had some really, in, you know, in big challenges, but they made me better and they gave me a lens on life that is is one that I could never have had otherwise. And so as weird as it sounds, I'm like, thank you. Thank you, cancer. Thank you for taking me to the edge. Had I been told that you're going to live, but everything that you are, everything that you have, everything that you think you are, and all of your dreams are gone. I know what I would have done. And I would have said, can I have my shoes, please? I know it, right? I know it. Because that's what happened. I woke up to find my husband was a drug addict. We had no money. Like he, nothing. He'd taken it all um, and used it. He had no job. I didn't know that. Um, Turns out that the job that I had and that I was on, you know, leave from actually had been um, re, what's the right word? It didn't exist. And I have every confidence in the world that, that when we die, regardless of how it happens, um, it's all okay. Everyone suffers in their own way, in their own time, for their own reason. 
What is your first reaction when I say the following statement? I'm grateful for the Parkinson's experience. Oh, and why are you grateful? Mm -hmm. Tell me why. I get it. I know you are. For sure you are, and you have to be. Yeah. Yeah. Some surprise and some sadness. And I think those are because of the labels that I project on onto Parkinson's and my understanding of what that means. I can appreciate the struggle. And I think it makes sense that you're grateful because, uh, you know, from what I have seen and what you've shared, um, you are embracing the complexity of it. Yes. And is that true for you? Y yeah, most of the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it doesn't have to be all the time, right? And I think that's, that's really important to see that we don't have to pretend that we're grateful. Um, I guess I have a question for you is like, what... What do you feel most grateful about it? I see significant change in who you are and how you are. I've seen you way more patient, way more generous, um, kind, all those loving things that um, maybe just got boxed up. It was a lot easier to connect with you and have a chat with you. and You would have been a difficult pupil. <laughs> There's a there's an understatement, <laughs> right? Because you, you you would have had your back up about about uh, how life was and what life was about. It's opened you up, and it's it's not who you are. Um, it's it's um, it's just allowed it a whole other world. And I hear you being kinder to yourself. I feel love. I feel grateful for you for saying that to me because that just reinforces everything that I believe. I'm grateful that you can be grateful. <laughs> I think that's beautiful. I, I, I believe um, that you are onto something truly uh, uh, spiritual and uh, I, I'm grateful to be the witness. Like the old saying goes, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, right? This is a challenge that you've been throwing is you're going to fight it and you're going to beat it, you know, and that that's where you're going to come out and see, I told you so. I'm not hearing you going, yay, I'm glad I have Parkinson's, but you're grateful for what you've coalesced with it and, and around it, right? And I think that's the thing I, I have to say too often, and maybe it's just because of the way news bites work and this and that, I really cringe every time it goes, people go, I'm so grateful I have whatever. That's, that may be the case, but I think more often there's a more precise perspective. And for that, I have all ears, you know, because sometimes I think the whole truth is not really discussed. Like you can say, you know, and you kind of alluded to that, like, you know, it's not great having Parkinson's. I mean, it's not as big a deal as perhaps you had wondered initially or maybe feared. And yet all of these other benefits are really amazing. So how can you knock it because it's giving you all this stuff? But it's not as pleasant as not having it, right? You know, when I last visited you, you know, here's this person who's really uncovering all this amazing humanity. Yeah. Um, I now have an assumption that anyone that has a, a sudden <laughs> departure from the life that they thought that they had planned, um, I just assume that there's the potential for gratitude and growth and really positive change there. And so it's not surprising to me that someone like you was able to do that.
you know, I take myself back after genocide. The moment I did not, I denied my parents were, were killed. You will have denying moment. I think you will have anger. You will have time to see, I will not do this, I will not derise this. Allow you the time just to say, okay, so what? It happened. And I dreamed. I dreamed as I dreamed to have my parents and to grow, to see my, my cousins, to see my village, to see everything. And one day it was like, no way. No parents, no house, no cousin, no brother, nothing. It was like, my world was the, the, the way around. Your life is the way around for sure. But you are there. You are there. What can you do with this? Just find a purpose. Whatever achievements, attainments, accolades that you have received in your life, they are icing on the cake. You are the best in cake, perfectly baked. And you have to know that deep inside yourself. Life is short. <laughs> For me, it's short. <laughs> Enjoy the moment you have. And with what you have. Enjoy people around you, good people. And my, me, now I tell myself, people who take away my positive energy, no. I need my positive energy to focus because I don't have enough time. The lessons I learned were whatever was the physical part going on was just the experience in the moment. And when I could take myself to a better place emotionally and spiritually, then my body was able to work out what it needed to work out and I had little or no experience of the worst physical part because I took myself someplace emotionally and spiritually more pleasant. I hated being told this. Oh my God, did I hate it. But at the end of the day, I had to eat crow. And, you know, sometimes what doesn't kill you does make you stronger. Um, and it, but not just stronger, better. There's no shortcut. No one else can fix it. I'm the only one who can fix this, and I have to do it from the inside. We are all connected to each other. Never give up on yourself.